We're, we're starting basically about, uh, uh, with a, a book which talks about the capabilities approach, Amartya Sen's work, and applies it to the field of ICT for development. But when we say that, ICT for development, um, one of the things I keep harping on about is we need to define what we mean by the D. What do we mean by development? And in order to explain that, I'd like uh, you to think for a moment about what it is that you personally value in your life. You don't have to talk about it, just think about it for a moment. Yeah? Just what is it you value? First things that come to your mind. Okay. Well, many of you will have had, you know, you will have all kind of different ideas of what that might have been. But few of you will have thought piles of money, per se. It might be piles of money in order for me to kind of, you know, buy a house, live with everyone I like together, um, possibly piles of money to go and travel, possibly piles of money to do whatever. But um, economic resources are, for many of us, not an, um, an aim in itself. And equally, when we think about development, we need to, super, um, we need to overcome this idea of development being measured in just economic growth terms. We need to think much more holistically about development. So that's my starting point for the book. We need to think differently about development. Currently, the, the dominant measure for development is economic growth. We need to think more holistically. Now, within development, we need to move from not just from the econocentric to the holistic. We need to move from the linear to a more systemic understanding of development. Um, we need to move from top down to a much more dialogue driven form of development where we're engaging with citizen users. And I would argue we need to move away from a supply led um, approach to more of a choice led approach. Any of this is kind of explained in greater detail in the book. And also if you'd like to come back on that in question, that's absolutely fine. Now, the capabilities approach, which Amartya Sen presented and which earned him um, the Nobel, P uh, Nobel Peace Prize, possibly, but the Nobel <laughs> Prize for Economics, um, was that to see development in, in pluralistic terms. So talking about development as a process of expanding the real freedoms that people enjoy, particularly focusing on the substantive freedom of people to lead the lives that they themselves have reason to value and to enhance the real choices that they have. So what we're talking here is a, a radical departure from a, a, a paradigm of economic growth, moving towards much more uh, a paradigm of asking people themselves what it is they value in their lives. Capabilities, uh, as a term slightly jargony, uh, possibly also um, prone for misunderstanding, but in sense terms, capabilities means things that people have a reason to value doing or being. And so the, the capabilities approach is a key alternative to growth-focused uh, development approaches, and it forms the basis of the Human Development Index, which UNDP has established since 1990, and which basically allows us to talk about uh, countries and rank countries in a different way, not just according to growth. But Sen himself says that the HDI is effectively a very crude measure and that surely we need to find other ways of operationalizing his approach as well. So how do we operationalize the capabilities approach? Well, just in the area of ICT for D, there's been a lot of people working on this. Um, and I'm very delighted to say that I know a few of them. One of them is right on the corner of the table there. Um, Ing Tsin Cheng is a colleague working in the management department, uh, of, uh, also of Royal Holloway. Uh, she's a recognized scholar in this area, uh, down with the flu, that's why she's not here, but um, very influential um, in this area. Um, and also, we've got uh, forthcoming scholars um, Samia Kovia and Tony Roberts also at Royal Holloway working on this. So we've basically got a, a community of people who are trying to kind of come to terms with this, operationalizing this, um, and it's an exciting field to be part of. So my own way of, of translating the capabilities approach um, in this community of scholars is the choice framework. It's effectively 
um, an attempt to translate the richness, the theoretical richness of the capabilities approach into something which is much more manageable for potentially for practitioners, um, for engaged uh, academics, um, for monitoring evaluation purposes, and so on. I'll talk a little bit more about what you can do with all of this. As you can see, it's, uh, as far as diagrams go, it's more on the um, complex side. Uh, so I'll briefly talk you through it. So we have four key elements. Um, we've got uh, structure, agency, degrees of empowerment, and development outcomes. And you might see these arrows. So we're talking about a, syst a systems approach, it's something systemic here with feedback loops. And the story goes like this. There are effectively 11 different resources um, that form the basis of an individual's agency. Um, by that I mean both material and non-material resources. So just reading there, educational resources, psychological resources, information, financial resources, cultural resources, time, social resources, natural resources, material resources, geographical resources, and health. And yes, all the definitions are in the book. Um, you basically have um, an individual with these particular resources um, navigating the social structures that they find themselves in. I use Giddens structuration theory to try and make sense how agency and structure are connected here. Again, you, you can go into that as much as you'd like to, but in practical terms it means that in order to make use of these resources, individuals need to um, operate in whatever sort of social context that they are, um, are embedded in. And that means that there are institutions, discourses, policies and programs, formal and informal laws, and particularly important for ICT4D, technology and innovations in that space. So this means that there's an interaction between the resources a person can draw on and the structural uh, conditions that they find themselves in through which they can navigate how much choice they have. And within the choice, I then kind of go on, and I work here with Alsop and Heinzon's approach. Um, uh, I'm looking basically at existence of choice, use of choice, and achievement of choice, and drawing on, on field work, basically one of the aspects that have come up is particularly sense of choice as an important additional dimension to include in this section. If you're wondering how exactly all of that's going to pan out, don't worry, I'll have an example um, later on. Um, for development outcomes, I'm sticking very much with uh, Zen on the primary development outcome being choice, and secondary outcomes, well, we can't define them for people. That's the whole point of the capabilities approach. Basically, individuals have their own um, choices, what they value doing or being, and therefore that defines what is here in the outcome space. And depending on whether it's achieved or not, this basically then feeds into the structural conditions and back to their agency, in theory. Um, these are just some elements that came directly from field work, um, basically emerging. Um, the, the framework developed over three um, rows of um, ethnographic field work. So all of this is embedded, if you want, in a, an approach of grounded theory where particular aspects such as sense of choice and norms on use of time and space emerged from the fieldwork. How might this be applied? Um, well, uh, this, it's a question of um, starting to deconstruct what values are embedded in technologies, asking how much freedom of choice individuals have when they engage with technology, uh, it could be a systematic, uh, a systemic mapping of development processes, so actually using this as a form of checklist. Um, and indeed, and potentially most challenging, designing and planning for choice. So all of this now, I'll try to put into uh, a kind of a case study context. Uh, this is the horizon in southern Chile. It's a photo for those of you who've seen the cover of the book. This might look fa vaguely familiar. And um, Molly Siemens at MIT Press did a fantastic job to then um, use this particular image and uh, to do wonderful things, whatever um, sort of cover designers do, to basically create uh, the, front, uh, the frontispiece and the cover for the book. 
uh, a little bit of information about Chile. So we're talking about a country which in many ways has been held up as an example to other countries in the region and beyond. Um, a country that has uh, basically seen decade, uh, a decade of continued economic growth, uh, low levels of corruption overall, uh, high literacy level, and a good IT infrastructure. Um, you can see this is from the, um, from the ITU in 2002, so it kind of precedes all the field work, but it basically shows how Chile, just in terms of what the ITU calls e-readiness, was ahead of the Latin American continent. And that was something that also was very much in the, uh, in the political discourse of Chile at the time. There is clearly a potential for ICT-assisted development here. At the same time, Chile suffered from a high level of social inequality, um, somewhat typical for Latin America more generally, and also high levels of regional inequality, which in part had to do with the fact that we're talking about 4,000 kilometer lengths, um, a country that's more shaped like a pencil, um, and with the capital sort of around here. Um, so a high degree of regional inequality as well. So in other words, for ict for d scholars, you might translate that in an ex into an expectation of digital divides. The methodology of the case study then includes uh, work at the national level, the regional level, and also the local level. Um, so everything from a policy analysis and interviews with policymakers uh, down to actually at the local level, a variety of, um, of methods there including interviews, including maps, including participant observation. Policy analysis, well, the Chilean Agenda Digital was really a, a pioneering set of policies, uh, introducing ICT policies at the national level across sectors. Uh, and I focus particularly on three work strands, um, a network of info centers, so telecenters with free access to the internet, um, E-government initiatives, so uh, it's particularly e-procurement. Procurement is the way that the state buys goods and services, and this was basically online buying of goods and services in the name of the taxpayers. Um, and digital literacy training um, through a, a digital literacy campaign. These policies were um, envisioned in the atmosphere of, of um, Santiago, the capital. And this gives you an idea, this is the central business district in Santiago. Uh, down here is the, um, the subway, uh, the underground uh, in Santiago de Chile, which with its Wi-Fi enabled zones, etc., would be the envy of London transport. Uh, and it's very kind of clean and very modern space. This is a typical street uh, scene, basically personalized uh, uh, laptops basically as a form of um, equipment for a kind of a, a, a just a modern professional. And uh, posters like these that kind of advertise uh, you know learning English as a way of um, finding social mobility not just within the country but also internationally. So there are discourses here around modernity, discourses of um, how that is linked into a pattern of kind of globalization and also how IT is connected into that and an understanding of Chile as a modern and ambitious society. IT here um, is, is also part of this discourse of social mobility. So these are kind of IT training courses. Um, this might be a site for one of my um, policy in policymaker interviews. So, um, sort of the seventh to ninth floor here is the headquarters of this kind of online procurement center positioned in the central business district of Santiago. And I, this might be a quote coming from the interview. Uh, from the, interview. Um, the deputy director of Chile Comfra, this is the online procurement center uh, system talking uh, in August 2005 to me, the important thing is that people are proactive and are interested in doing better than others. We have to create the conditions and the tools in which they can do that. This all has to do with the economic model in which Chile is developing itself. Yes, in the end, this is a neoliberal market economy, 
in which the lances all point in one direction so that the most efficient will win. So this is, you know, in a Chile where we have effectively a, a centre-left government at the time, but where the neoliberal course that basically was brought in by Pinochet, Harvey calls it the first neoliberal experiment, basically has been carried through also successive um, democratic governments, and where, in a way, Chile Comfort still represents this kind of course of deregulation and market opening. All of these policies effectively writ into technology. He goes on then and says, well, of course there's these rural areas. I believe that essentially one has to invest much more in education in the regions as well, especially the rural sphere. How to include it in the wagon of productivity, in the engine of development. But at the same time, this is difficult because there are also obviously the values of these communities. Values that can be from another planet, even other spiritual beliefs. So this is a, a story of development on a, on a single track, um, where the aim is basically just getting the people that seem to be not on the track, not on the wagon, onto the wagon and all traveling in the same direction. It's an image which is strikingly different from the radical pluralism that Zen uses in his thinking about development. And this is where this kind of contrasts so strongly. In the next phase of my uh, fieldwork, I then went to the other planet, uh, the rural sphere. So this is, uh, this is uh, Algun, I call it. Uh, it's a small place, 13,000 people in the south of Chile. Um, and it's a place where I conducted my fieldwork. Algun is a pseudonym, of course, um, and so are all the other names that I'm using. Um, you can see how there's limited public infrastructure in that there's, um, there's no kind of pavements, um, and you can see private investment in communication structures. There's already these kind of two mobile phone antennas. Um, different technologies exist at the same time in Algun, um, and you can again see the um, issues with investment in local infrastructure, here the potholes, and the private investment of cyber cafes. Town of 13,000 people, five and later seven cyber cafes at the end of the year of field work. Um, so there was clearly some sort of demand for ICT services. For those people who had the hard hardware, um, they would actually also display, for example, the computer in the living room and show that this was, this was available as a symbol of modernity and also a status symbol. Um, and this is the kind of environment where I would then be able to kind of do my interviews and people very kindly allowed me to take photographs. Um, this is uh, the telecenter. So I spoke about the national network of telecenters. The idea was to create um, uh, equal opportunities of access, so to allow everyone to actually access the internet this way. Goals were social, uh, social inclusion and equal opportunity. Um, there would be only a small fee for printing and other services, access was free, and there would also be this campaign for digital literacy, um, which meant that there were free IT courses um, from, uh, from the government provided to out-of-school adults. So, in uh, chapter six, I then take this one step further and actually look at just the individual's lives um, in Algun. So I take a few examples that, of people that I introduce um, to the reader. One of them is Marta Castillo. So Marta Castillo is a micro-entrepreneur. Um, she's also a single mom, head of a household, um, with care responsibilities for three children and a grandmom. Uh, and she's on a low income, has basic education, but, and this is one of her trump cards, she derives cultural resources from the fact that she was a cook or a maid in Santiago for a rich family for a while, and that meant that she's got these excellent cooking skills, and she knows the fancy names for the cooking, uh, she also knows how to kind of prepare it in a way that looks attractive and so on, and these, this knowledge is the basis for her catering service. Um, she took free IT courses at the Info Center, so she benefited from this free IT access um, and access to the internet in the telecenter. 
and she uses the internet in the info center to research recipes to diversify her production. Basically, she's got the psychological resources to figure out that the population in Algun is aging, that means higher rates of diabetes, that means higher demand also for um, cookies and pastries, also for diabetics, and she looks up recipes online to meet that demand. Um, she also is looking to provide for hospitals and schools, and therefore she's uh, looking to get together, use her social resources to get together a group of women um, to actually provide these um, foodstuffs like pastries, like jam and so on, for the hospital uh, in particular and for the school, many of the boarding schools. Um, for all the people I interviewed, I did um, these kind of spider di diagrams of their media usage. So this kind of shows you the impact that the telecenter had in the life of Marta. This whole triangle here is basically her internet usage, which basically came up to at least once a day. Um, and you can see that otherwise her mobile usually uh, texting usage is there, and she's also using television and radio, black and white te television, but hey. Um, so this gives you an idea of, of um, what the internet meant for um, Marta here. Um, she was also really interested in Chile Compra. Um, people had told her also when she trained in the IT course that um, government buying would be moving online. So it would be important to get, you know, get to know the system. Um, but she had never used the public e-procurement system, Chile Compra. But things were moving fast, however. In the same year, within half a year, the entire system of online buying was switched over to online. Um, and the local hospital in Algun started actually using Chile Compra. And because the only uh, criteria that was used in Chile Compra was price, and competition was entirely on price, it meant that in the logic of this very transparent and efficient neoliberal system, they, the local um, uh, public servants were sourcing their jars of jam from uh, Santiago. Uh, that was eight hours by truck away. And in an area where, uh, in Algun, there was uh, certainly great amounts of um, under and unemployment, that meant even less money stayed in the local economy. So I used the example of Marta. Um, if you scale that up, it effectively meant that the introduction of the online procurement system effectively meant about 21% less of orders uh, of the local um, municipality and hospital actually stayed in the local economy. So significantly here, the great idea that was kind of um, brought up in, in uh, Santiago had negative effects in the local economy. So what does that have to do with the choice framework? Okay, let's just take Marta. So Marta has clearly got these social resources, her group of women. Uh, also, she knows the director of the telecenter well, good social resources, cultural resources. Uh, she's got these kind of cooking skills and the knowledge um, how to present that from Santiago. Um, her geographical resources, just in terms of location, are fantastic in that she's only 20 minutes away from the telecenter. Um, material resource, not very good. Financial resources, worse. Um, time, well, she's a head of household, so she's got a degree of control over her own time. She doesn't have a husband who tells her whether or not she can go out at particular times. Um, educational resources, formally quite basic, um, but someone who constantly wants to learn, see her, her training in the telecenter. Um, health was so-so, uh, and in terms of psychological resources, well, impressive. Uh, creativity, resilience, and a kind of a constant, sort of a persistent looking for opportunities in order to um, provide the livelihoods for her family. So an individual who was income poor, but in many ways resource rich. So Marta was then navigating the structures. And the structures, you know, whatever, however they were in place, there were new institutions like the telecenter that had come into her, um, uh, that had come into her village, her town, um, and new policies such as the online procurement system that had basically also influenced her livelihoods and her life. 
and technologies, of course, the rapid change uh, towards um, online, uh, the fact that she now could access the internet meant that she could access this information about the recipes for diabetics and so on. Uh, ICTs were available thanks to the free IT uh, systems uh, that the state was providing via the telecenter. It was affordable. She built up the skills and she took the free IT course. And in terms of the norms on the uses of space, the library where the telecenter was located was a space that she as an elderly woman, elderly, well, middle-aged elderly, um, felt that she could easily go. So for her, she was able to use some of these resources in the structures. Some of the structures had worked out in her favor. Some of them had worked out against them. This meant that this affected her choices and certainly affected the kind of development outcomes that she chose for herself. Now, one of those things, the things that she chose from this list were, for example, easier communication, increased knowledge, uh, or indeed increased income. So a combination, not just increased income, but a variety of things that she was interested in. So to conclude, okay, I've given you a run through several of the kind of chapters in the book, and you might want to pick up in questions or also just by flipping through the book and having a read um, some of these points in greater detail. But here's just a few conclusions. We need to think development not as growth, but as freedom of people to live the lives that they have reason to value. So we need to move beyond economic growth here. Um, we need to accept that individuals and communities may have very different values. And instead of just getting everyone onto the same track, we need to understand that a, an approach of radical pluralism, like the capabilities approach, is far more morally appropriate and empirically correct. Um, we need to uh, think in, in how we might operationalize these things. So I'm offering the choice framework as if effectively a living tool. There's other frameworks, there's other ways of operationalizing. But certainly the choice framework is an opportunity to basically mix and match, to mess about with it, see what, what works for you. What if this needs to, needs to be deeper theorized, deeply, more, more deeply theorized? Plenty. Um, but a lot of this is also uh, a reminder of how these different elements in the development process are actually linked up. And we need to think about what ideas are embedded, especially in technologies. So those of us who are working in ict for d we need to think more about what values are embedded in technologies. So instead of pretending that technologies are neutral tools, we need to keep deconstructing and understanding what ideas and politics and ideologies and values are in those technologies. Um, we might also move to a space where we stop thinking of poor people. Um, rather, we recognize that income poor people have, have many resources as well. And we need to respect their agency. It's not just social capital that is the resource of the poor, but there's multiple. There's cultural resources, and there's importantly psychological resources. But it's also important that while we should never underestimate agency for individuals, um, we also need to recognize that structures are powerful, and that structures need to be adjusted to support people's agency and support people's choice. Um, in very concrete terms, particularly for the practitioners in the room, this might mean seeking mechanisms to allow people to express choice. So I've just given you a list here of things. So we might be thinking, when we think about technology, about more open and malleable forms of technology, about participatory design approaches to technology or architecture. Some colleagues in, in architecture are, are at the moment also experimenting with the choice framework. And it's really interesting to watch that interface. Um, we might want to recognize and negotiate um, some of the challenges to this the, the framework as it is. For example, we need to negotiate the fact that all of our um, decisions and choices are embedded within ecological limits and that we need to face some social challenges which can only be negotiated collectively. So there's a research frontier for you. Um, practical terms. Uh, applications might also be voucher schemes, participatory budgets, participatory procurement, 
and participatory monitoring and evaluation. If you see a theme going on here about participation, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And it's something that is quite explicit in Zen and something that we, we do a lot, whether um, at, at Holloway we do it a lot um, when we kind of talk theoretically or also on, on, the, on the master's program. But participation and choice in many ways are deeply linked. So we need to think about development beyond the growth paradigm. And we need to plan and design for choice. And with that, I'm just going to conclude, and I'm really interested to hear what the panel has to say. So thank you very much. <laughs>